I think we're ready to start. Let me just. All right. Welcome everyone to the uh, technical panel session at all Day. My name is Andrew, and I'm a software engineer in the Advanced Technology Group at Pinterest. Today, I have the pleasure of moderating this panel of our immensely talented group of senior ICs at Pinterest who have experience covering this, uh, the majority of ML use cases at Pinterest. Uh, from the rec recommendation technology that powers our visual discovery feeds uh, to our ads marketplace systems that generate billions of revenue, uh, and also to the computer vision algorithms that laid the foundation uh, for all. I'm super excited to have this group together and to start things off, how about I pass this uh, virtual baton around the room uh, for a round of introductions, uh, starting with Jay. Yeah, I'm Jay Adams. I'm a software engineer on the Pinner Growth and Engagement uh, in the Pinner Growth and Engagement Org. And uh, I develop uh, organic recommendation technology for a variety of applications. All right, I'll pass the buck to uh, Xiaofang. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Xiaofang. I'm a software engineer in the uh, ads team. I mostly work on machine learning, uh, the, the ads delivery funnel, including targeting, retrieval, ranking, uh, marketplace, etc. I joined Pinterest about uh, nine years ago. Uh, I, I worked both in organic side and uh, the ad side. All right. Stephanie, you're next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I'm also a software engineer um, in the monetization org. And I work specifically on advertiser solutions, uh, building ML models that are not tightly tied to ads delivery, but are directly helpful for advertisers. Cool. That'll be Eric. Hi, uh, I'm Eric. I'm a software engineer on the advanced technologies group uh, visual team. So kind of the computer sub computer vision sub team of advanced technologies group. So we work on everything related to the beautiful pictures you see on Pinterest, understanding the content that's in them and linking them together in various ways. And my particular emphasis is focusing lately on generative models and seeing what we can produce with those sorts of techniques too. It'll be fun to dig into that. Awesome. Uh, so folks have heard a lot about Pinterest from our previous sessions, but I'll also just quickly recap uh, to set up the context for any new listeners. So Pinterest's mission is to bring everyone the inspiration to create the life they love. Uh, we do this by delivering inspirations from tens of billions of content to over 400 million users each month. Uh, when users find the content that they like, uh, they then repin that content uh, into their collection that we call a board. And machine learning is at the center of how we deliver inspiration at scale. Uh, through powering our recommendation and search systems, as well as our outgoing channels like notifications and SEO. What's really exciting about this session is that we're in a room with literally the IC engineers who get all of this ML work done. So this leads me to my first question for the panelists. How does Pinterest leverage machine learning to inspire our users? Maybe starting with Jay. Yeah, well, uh, I think there's, there's two parts to that. First, you have to ask so how do we know that they're inspired you know how, how can how do we recognize inspiration on the part of our users and it's kind of a hard problem uh because we think that just looking at a piece of content doesn't really tell you how inspirational the user found the content so we usually think that like if the user repins that content to a board um now that that's actually that user saving that content uh as it, you know possibly to visit later and then if they add more things to the same board, we think, oh, that means that the user is uh, really getting interested in this, uh, in, in similar uh, content. And we think that's a very strong signal that they, there's something about that that they've found inspirational. Um, some platforms have like other, have their own uh, explicit feedback signals like like, but we really think that this sort of, this, uh, this repinning and curating content really tells us a lot more about how inspired the user is, especially if we see the user coming back to that content in the future, uh, then it's, it's sort of more of a, an ongoing interest of that user. And then second, uh, you know, the second part of that is our, is machine learning. So I think Pinterest really has industry leading uh, machine learning technology in several areas. One of them is visual understanding. So that as soon as a new piece of content is uploaded, uh, we can process the raw pixels and the other features of that content 
and immediately get a pretty good idea of what that content is about and uh, who it might appeal to. And the other thing we have uh, that I think is really industry leading is our, our graph neural network technology. And as Chuck said earlier this evening, you know, when, when, when uh, our users pin content to boards, the pins and boards create this kind of pin board graph. And by understanding that graph, we can understand a lot more about the content and sort of what it means to people. Um, and so also today we've heard about transformer technology that we're now using to understand like how people engage with content over time. So I think all of these things are, are really superpowers of Pinterest when it comes to applying machine learning to uh, uh, inspiring users. Um, building off of Jay's point, I guess. Um, so Jay mentioned that you know visual understanding sort of helps with our recommendation systems and help, like helps connect content in this sort of content graph. Um, I that's an important part of sort of what the computer vision team here is interested in. I think also we do expose visual search directly to the users, and I think that in and of itself is already kind of a useful way for helping pinners get inspired. You know, you're browsing the site, um, you're looking at pins. Um, I think the images are a lot of times the first impression that a pin is making on a user. Um, and it's nice to be able to sort of see something that you like, click into it, um, be able to very quickly find other things, um, other related visual concepts. You know, um, even if you don't have the words necessarily to describe what it is you're looking for, you can start with a broad search query, scroll through the results, find something specific, and then use visual search to sort of follow that line of um, inspiration to content that you're actually interested in. Um, I find myself doing this sometimes, uh, searching for furniture. Um, you're looking for a particular style, but you don't know what the word is. Maybe you find a particular chair that you like, so you start visual searching, and pretty soon you know that what you're looking for is you want a bent wood chair, a particular style. You can find that very precisely. I think that's a pretty cool way that like visual search can sort of help people put words to ideas that are only in their head, and that can lead to more inspiration down the line, too. Uh, on the monetization side, I would say, as we know, our Pinterest value is uh, to, to bring everyone the inspiration to create a life they love. Uh, ads can be the one to help people to create a life they love. So um, for ads in ML, we try our best to provide an ads experience that uh, inspire Pinterest to go from inspiration to action, for example, to go to the ads, which uh, uh, seems very relevant to click the ads or to go to the website to buy those uh, items. We heavily use uh, machine learning in every aspect of our ad system, from uh, ads delivery funnel, advertiser solutions uh, aspect, uh, including targeting, retrieval, advertiser growth, uh, measurement, modeling, relevance, marketplace, etc. So this is actually a really great segue to our next question. So we've heard from Jay that uh, repins are really important to Pinterest. We think it's quite a powerful signal. Uh, we have recommendation systems, search systems, visual search systems as well, powered by computer vision tech, GNNs. Um, this is all about connecting users to content. Uh, but Pinterest has all sorts of content, like Xiaofang was mentioning. We have ads, we have products, uh, we have content from creators, uh, and we have a lot more. So Pinterest plays this role to connect our users as well to these sort of creators, advertisers, merchants, and really try to balance the, the interests of each of these products. Uh, parties. For example, advertisers probably want some sort of performance uh, for, for their ads, stuff like that. How do we leverage machine learning to address these uh, multiple incentives? Uh, maybe, Xiaofang, would you answer that last question? We can start with you as well. Sure, um, I can give some example of uh, how we use machine learning in our ads delivery funnel. For example, uh, Jay and Eric just mentioned that, uh, you know, we have uh, a lot of uh, organic engagement examples, uh, events on, from our natural user interaction on Pinterest. So when users engage uh, organic content, our, for example, that can, those kind of uh, signals can be used in our ads targeting. And we will take that feedback and we were targeting the very relevant ads to those users. For example, if some users are very interested in, for example, DIY uh, certain uh, stuff, uh, then we will try to show DIY ads. Um, our retrieval and ranking are the ones which mostly heavily use uh, machine learning to predict uh, the ads click-through rate, conversion rate, etc. Uh, for example, 
uh, the in terms of uh, model architecture, attention, uh, transformer, deep cross network, uh, multi tower, multi task. This kind of model architecture has have been used in these models uh, for quite some time. And uh, for retrieval, we have been applying this uh, two tower learner retrieval for all the uh, as retrieval for uh, in for shopping and uh, uh, non shopping ads also for our relevance, the human weighted relevance, we have been applying similar model stack, although probably less than the uh, so advanced uh, uh, safe and poor transformer, those kind of model architecture, because we don't have uh, so many examples, uh, human weighted uh, examples to choose from. Uh, last but not least, in the ads marketplace, uh, this year we launched the model based whole page optimization. This involves uh, considering the organic content and uh, uh, that that a user will will see together with uh, the available ads to maximize the Pinterest long term revenue by providing a more flexible uh, way to determine determine the ad load and the placement of those ads on the page. Stephanie, you work on the other side of I mean advertiser uh, side of uh, ads, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I'd like to take a slightly different direction to what Xiaofeng um, has already described. So she's described how when a user visits Pinterest, there's all these different systems that have to work together really well to deliver the best ad um, to the user. But the thing that's, in my opinion, really interesting about advertisers is that there's a number of constraints that go beyond a single um, a single session that, that involve hard constraints that apply to the advertiser across large amounts of time. Uh, for example, the advertiser has a budget that they are willing to spend, and we need to spend that over, say, a, a large period of time over, say, a month-long campaign. If we spend all of that on the first um, 10 minutes on every impression that they can possibly achieve, uh, that may uh, result in instant gratification, but it is likely not going to actually be the best set of users for that advertiser. So we need to really uh, figure out ways to um, build into our systems these like very hard constraints that the advertisers have. Uh, so um, I might highlight a few projects that we've we've worked on in the last year, and there have been two major focus areas for us. The first has been trying to reduce these, figure out a better way to use optimization to put these hard constraints into the system um, in a way that is still allowing for some flexibility. And then the second uh, is around models that provide recommendations uh, and work directly for advertisers that are maybe a little bit outside of the traditional um, ad delivery portion of the funnel. Um, so uh, one project I'd like to talk about is our project around flexible daily budgets. So in order to encode that hard um, budget that I mentioned, uh, we can think of it as a um, we, we can think about how the user's uh, spend actually, or the user availability varies over the course of a week. Users might spend more time on Pinterest on the weekends when they have more free time. And so we shouldn't set, say, a specific budget cap for every single day. Instead, we want to have a little bit of flexibility. Uh, so the project uh, that we worked on in the last year involved uh, actually uh, predicting the spend curves for the advertiser for each of the rest of the days in their campaign. So we would try to predict uh, essentially like if the advertiser spent more money, like how much uh, would they get in terms of whatever their goal metric is, clicks or conversions or whatever their, their goal is. Uh, and so we built up all of these different curves representing uh, the expected uh, results on different days of the week. And we actually use a greedy optimization algorithm to figure out what is the best way to allocate that advertiser's budget over the remaining days in their campaign. Uh, that was really cool work that um, I really enjoyed looking at. I think another area that we've been very um, excited about is around automated targeting. So advertisers have to put a lot of work into targeting their ads to specific users, um, figuring out exactly which search keywords, which interests, um, what sort of their audience looks like. And so what we've introduced is some automated targeting that for advertisers that turn it on um, will we'll treat their targeting uh, more as a suggestion. 
And if we find other users who are also highly likely to convert on their ads, we'll show ads to those users as well. Um, a final project I may mention is for advertisers who are not having as good of a time on Pinterest. Um, we've also started working on advertiser churn models that are explainable. So we want to make sure that we can predict which advertisers are having trouble um, setting up ads and why that's happening and give that information to our sales team so they can reach out and try to help that advertiser to have a better experience. So uh, I talked a lot, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that, uh, you know, I'm an organic guy, so uh, I don't think of this as, you know, it's a trade-off of one, one uh, actor against another. You know, in the case of merchants, for example, maybe the, a good experience for uh, pinners is to, is to actually see content that's shoppable. Uh, you know, it's, you know, you know, window shopping used to be a thing, right? So, you know, it's one thing like if you're planning a project, maybe building like a gazebo in your backyard, it's one thing to see this fancy gazebo that some creative and person built somewhere in the world. It's quite another to see one that you could actually buy and that you can say, hey, I can even do this even if I'm not a, a you know, an expert at, you know, building and designing structures like this. So we tend to think of it like, it's not a it's not a it's not a trade off of 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 uh, people on the platform. It's uh, something that can make it better for everybody. Yeah, I, I think I tend to agree with Jay's line of thinking here, um, at least on the sort of visual search side of things. We think a lot about that, too, because it's visual search doesn't just have to be between other organic content. Right. Sometimes the right thing to be returning when someone's visual searching is some sort of shoppable product. Right. You're browsing home decor ideas, you're looking at various different rooms that are all like really good looking, really inspiring to you. And you see like that, that coffee table, like that looks really great. Like that would go great in my living room. And that's like the perfect opportunity to sort of capture that intent, um, be able to turn it into something that works well for advertisers too. We can sort of meet the users at the exact moment where they want to search for something. Um, and I think that's sort of a unique advantage that we have a lot of the time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Going a bit deeper into content, it seems like both uh, for inspiration for these different tenants, it's all about the content. And maybe this is more of a fun question, but uh, sort of timely given all this like external hype around you know these AI generated content through like stable diffusion, GBT, these other methods. I'm curious, like, do we leverage? How do we leverage ML for content creation? So. Uh... I mentioned earlier that I'm sort of focused on generative models, especially lately. And I think that's one of the things that our team is really, really excited about is like these models are working way better than ever before and are generating these really impressive images. And we're sort of thinking about like, how can we leverage that as another form of like inspiration for users, right? And so we're sort of imagining, I think the most natural thing that comes to mind first is just like a user has some sort of idea. You know, a lot of times they're searching those ideas into the search query box and trying to find existing ideas on the Pinterest website. Um, but some one of the kind of some of the ideas we're imagining are like can users instead use some sort of tool to directly take the idea that they have in their head and even if that content doesn't exist on the site, um, we can generate it on the fly using one of these models too. I think that's sort of most in line with what we've been seeing with these other existing diffusion models um, where you type in some sort of text caption. Um, and I, I think we are sort of interested in being able to put a Pinterest spin on it. Um, but I think there's a lot of other possibilities like leaving it at that would sort of be selling it short. Um, and there's a lot more directed approaches you can imagine, like try on experiences of like, here's a clothing item, like what does this look like directly on a photo of me, let's say, right? And so there's a lot of, you know, Pinterest unique experiences that aren't just limited to this sort of generic uh, image generation thing. I think there's a lot of other exciting opportunities that are more out there too. Um, you know, right now when users go to the site, they save their pins to boards and then they, that helps them organize information and find inspiration in those ideas too. But like, what if we could also take the content that people are saving to these boards and help them use that to remix it and generate new content to, um, you know, take all of the items that you've pinned to some sort of board and then sort of render an image that contains all of those in a single cohesive scene. So you can see how this look you're imagining really all fits together, I think. Um, we're excited about a really broad range of use cases for these things. I think there's a lot of possibilities here. Um, I might follow up uh, on Eric's point here. Um, on the ad side, generating an ad, creating an ad, even if you have all the different ad assets, you have an image, you have text that might be used as a caption, you have a call to action or some different potential text for that, you have your, your brand logo, 
like figuring out how to put that all together is actually very hard. Um, we ran a challenge a few years ago where we had some of our ads engineers try putting together ads for a local nonprofit. And we had really not great results. Like definitely it's, it's a difficult, difficult problem to solve. Uh, so one area that I'm pretty excited around is, is around um, automated ad layouts. This isn't something that we have developed yet, but it's an area we're interested in in the future, is can I uh, use a generative model to figure out what is the best place given an image to place all of the text and all of the other things so that it looks beautiful and so that the advertiser maybe doesn't have to spend so much time putting all the pieces together and can just have a performant ad that works well on the screen. Um, so that's one area that we're really interested. I think even further in the future, um, we would really like today we have all of these uh, shopping like product images that are photographed beautifully on a white background. If you're looking for the details of exactly which chair you want and you really want to compare that, it's perfect for that. But if you're still not sure what type of chair you want, it's it's uh, not very um, visually appealing to just see this image of a chair in a white background uh, compared to um, like the rest of the more inspirational content in a normal Pinterest feed. So generating uh, a scene uh, basically around that image, trying to figure out a way to make, it, make a more natural composed um, like generative background um, that helps show like what this chair might look like in a typical living space rather than simply in a white background is something that uh, that seems like a wonderful future direction to go. Amazing. <laughs> this all, all sounds super cool. I want, I, I've been asking sort of more like targeted questions um, for the last, you know, three questions, I guess. I wanted to also just give some space to the panelists and ask this very broad question. So like, you know, with even we, so not constrained within Pinterest, but just like broadly in the field of machine learning, uh, what gets you all excited and why? Uh, I can start first. Uh, I know these days everyone is excited about this uh, generative uh, generative uh, modeling, like uh, Dali two. Uh, Eric, uh, you are working on some cool stuff. Uh, for me, uh, on the info side, I'm personally excited about uh, the GPU serving in recommendation system in industry. Uh, we know that uh, this uh, GPU serving has been used uh, uh, for image processing for quite some time, but uh, it's still relatively early for uh, large scale recommendation systems usage in industry. So uh, with GPU, uh, that brings uh, the possibility of using a lot more features. For example, a lot more raw features, the time sequence features, uh, so that we can uh, do something a lot, lot more uh, interesting for machine, machine learning. On the modeling side, uh, I'm personally excited about uh, this uh, reinforcement learning. So high level basically, uh, today we are doing this uh, point, uh, point to point prediction. For example, giving a user, giving a pin, we try to predict the click rate or the repin rate, etc., for that pair. Uh, this reinforcement learning hopefully can um, allow us to do a more global optimization of a longer uh, period of time window. For for example, uh, in the ads uh, uh, budgeting this uh, uh, space, we, we, we would like to try this uh, reinforcement learning to say, hey, what's the, uh, if there's a better, like the bidding, pacing, those kind of things to achieve uh, better performance, to yield better performance for our advertisers, for example, reduce their cost per click, cost per conversion. So that's me. Jay, I uh, wonder what's in your mind? <laughs> yeah, well, I, uh... I get excited about like what are the things that you know humans can do well that machines uh, can't yet do, and one of them I think is to learn things very quickly. Uh, in machine learning, we have this idea called self-supervised learning, where you'll you'll train just to learn representations of something so that later you can perform some tests. This is kind of like I think of it like you know if you've had a child, you know you didn't if you have a child and a cat, you don't have to show the child thousands of pictures of cats to get to know what a cat is. You know, the child has observed the cat and then maybe did maybe children do their own self-supervised learning. So 
when the parent says, hey, that's a cat, the, the child quickly learns that uh, the, to associate the word cat with the idea cat that it's already developed. And I think this is another thing that um, uh, humans do well is they have memory. They, if they have a bad experience or they do something wrong, they can remember it and, and use that knowledge very quickly. They don't have to go read a book or be trained about something. You put your hand on a hot stove, you're not gonna touch that stove again. You don't have to go study what a stove is to do that. So I, I'm really excited that machines can, can start to learn much more quickly. And does this have an, an application to recommendation systems? Yeah, maybe, because you know, if you say, I don't like something, you engage with the recommender somehow, it will quickly react to what you're doing and uh, not have to be retrained. Uh, as for me personally, um, as you can probably guess, I'm pretty excited about diffusion models, having worked a lot on generative stuff, but maybe not for the reason that you might expect. Um, I think there's a lot of attention on diffusion models because for the first time we're generating these sorts of crazy good looking images that are super almost photorealistic. Um, and I think that's a reason to be excited about it to prove that these models work really well. But I think part of the reason I'm excited is because they're they sort of work pretty differently than the deep networks we're used to, where like a normal deep network, you, it sort of looks at its data, you feed it through the network and it outputs a prediction. And that's the entire computation. This is sort of one shot um, forward pass through the network. And the difference with the diffusion model is that during this inference process, it's doing this um, predict, sort of denoise the image by some percentage, then take that input again and feed it back into the diffusion model and ask it to denoise again. So it's this iterative process, um, like a recurrence relation, where the output from the model from one time step is being fed in to the next time step. And that, that sort of enables the model to take its previous rough estimate and refine it further over time. So the model isn't just making like a single step prediction like it normally would. It gets to make a partial prediction, then look at that partial prediction, refine it over time. And I think that sort of general model of computation is the reason why these diffusion models are working so well as compared to something like a GAN that is doing it in a single shot. Um, I think that sort of idea of like a network that sort of makes rough guesses and then refines it over time. I think that aligns a lot more with the way at least I feel like I make decisions personally. Um, so it feels a little closer to a sort of a more robust way of doing this sort of long-term long decision-making. Um, and I think that there's sort of untapped potential in taking that idea, that general idea of like an iterated computation and iterated refinement over time and sort of backporting it to all of the other cases that we use in machine learning. Like why do all of those tasks in a single shot when we could also be doing this sort of iterative refinement approach? I think it, there's a lot of untapped potential there for things beyond just image generation. Um, so on my end, uh, I also have been thinking about generative models, but from the other side around privacy implications. So I've gotten really interested in privacy preserving machine learning. Um, when we think about generative models, they're trained on huge amounts of user data. Um, and they have this interface where uh, someone can like add a like talk to the model, you could you have an interface to to ask it to generate a sentence, uh, starting from a prompt like, what is Stephanie's social security number? And it would be good if the model did not respond with my actual social security number. And so um, I've been thinking a lot about how do we make sure that users data can be used to train these models, which are hugely beneficial, but without um, leading to, to any sort of loss of their privacy or of their pers their um, PII data. Uh, so one area that I'm really interested in is uh, differentially private model training, uh, which is a really cool idea that allows you to have a strong provable worst case guarantees about um, how user privacy is preserved. Um, so imagine that I trained two models, one using a large uh, data set that includes your data and another one that has the same large data set, but without your data. Um, if I train that using an epsilon differentially private process, um, when I start sending inference requests to that model, I can actually prove that for every possible output, um, there is never a difference between the output from model A and model B that's more than a small amount. Um, and I can prove that with like a very high probability. So I think figuring out ways to let these, uh, essentially to let users feel confident that their data is safe is really interesting to me. Yeah, it's also a really important problem. All right, I think, that, I think we're actually out of time. And 
we should, yeah, let's transition to the Q&A session. I think we have 10 minutes for that. And I want to make sure that we answer any questions that the audience has. Oh, awesome. So we have a question for Eric or Stephanie. But do you think the fusion model, actually, I don't know if I need to read this. No, if you want to just answer the question. <laughs> Um, sure, I, I can go first. And uh, so, do do we think diffusion models can eventually be improved enough to like be recommended to users as like ideas for their text prompt? I think if they're not already, they're basically kind of already there, right? At least some of the time. So I think that's this is sort of the trick and the challenge is like diffusion models. I think when they're working at their peak, like when they're generating the highest quality results, a lot of those results are really impressive. I think all it takes is sort of a look at like. These sorts of websites, like if you go to Lexica, where people are generating, like they're uploading their sort of best art generations from these prompts, right? I think it's clear that when the diffusion models are working really, really well, um, they're sort of already serving user needs. The question now is sort of how do you get to the point where they're consistently doing that? Um, and like also, I guess if you look at the sort of prompts on Lexica, they're very filled with keywords. And so I think there's a lot of challenges there in terms of like being able to capture sort of distill down the prompts so that a user can take a sort of vague idea and be able to flesh it out very, very quickly to generate these high quality results. But I actually think like in terms of like model capabilities, they're basically like mostly there. The challenge comes with a lot of the other side things, like making sure that, you know, we know when the model is firing on all cylinders. So we know this result is high quality and like making it easier for users to be able to sort of hit those high quality generations without having to go through all of the sort of rigmarole of um, like filling in the keywords in the appropriate way and like carefully wording all of the styles. Um, I think it's something that we're very excited about though. I think the models are clearly very capable. The only question is like, what is the right interface to sort of tap into that capability? I think Eric uh, covered basically every aspect of that question. Um, so I think I'll just add that, uh, kind of echo what he said about how a lot of the prompts that are used to generate these images today are uh, filled with a large number of keywords. And you see people doing a huge amount of prompt engineering to try to come up with like the right image, having to iteratively work through, you know, I want to hamster with a cowboy hat and then the hamster doesn't look right. So they say hamster cowboy hat Western scene and they kind of keep going until they get what they actually want that image to be. And that maybe doesn't end up saving a lot of work um, if you were say an advertiser who was trying to generate an ad image. Uh, so I think that we're not quite there yet from the point of view of creating say an ad that is directly usable um, but we're at a point where we can create a number of things that seem at least plausible. So I, I hope that, I think that we can get there for sure. Awesome. Let me just read the question so I have a purpose. <laughs> a few panelists mentioned reinforcement learning. Is reinforcement learning used in any systems architectures today? If not, uh, how might we use it in the future? Yeah, uh, you know, and we don't, I don't think we really use or, uh, reinforcement learning for organic recommendation today, because a lot of what reinforcement learning does for you is it's a way to, to go out and learn something if you don't have any training data, a way to, to kind of let the model generate its own training data. Well, we got tons of training data, so we don't really need that aspect of reinforcement learning. Also, you can apply reinforcement learning techniques even on log data, in which case is it, you know, is it reinforcement learning or is it just supervised learning? So, uh, we do mostly supervised learning, and but we're definitely thinking about like how do we learn what we do today that uh, keeps uh, our users engaged uh, next week and next month. It's like you know, and it's, more, it's kind of what I was talking about earlier. It's like what does inspiration look like, and how can we encourage that uh, that behavior in our users to indicate that they're getting inspired? Yeah. Same uh, in the ad side, uh, we haven't used any reinforcement learning ads. Uh, but we are thinking uh, probably if we want to try the first uh, uh, application might be bidding, pacing, uh, budgeting system. Um, but uh, we want to start simple as always. So let's see. All right. Um, I guess, so the question is, how do you code up this balance of needs of users with advertisers, uh, with merchants and all these other people? So I guess this has to do with the question we had around, 
how can you balance multiple incentives? Like, what does it actually mean? Uh, to me, um, I feel like, uh, for example, for, uh, by the way, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but uh, for example, for the ads, um, if the user searches uh, through a search query, and uh, we have a lot of uh, very relevant ads inventory, and uh, the, their quality is uh, as good as uh, the organic result, I think of, on Pinterest, we can just show uh, a lot, of, I mean, many more ads that on other platform or those kind of fixed ad, ad load. But when the ad, ads uh, relevance or quality is uh, not as uh, good as organic, then there's a trade-off. So whenever we display an ad, there's a displacement cost and we need to uh, carefully measure and guardrail that cost through, say, for example, long-term holdout to say, hey, what is uh, what, what our users really like? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, their longer term success on Pinterest, both from the user's point of view and from the advertiser point of view. So that's me. Who, who wants to take the next chair? Uh... Oh, that was a good answer. <laughs> cool. Uh... Next question is, can you tell us some advanced uh, examples of advancements in ML infrastructure of Pinterest and how they've enabled uh, these advancements in ML? Uh, maybe Xiaofang again, because uh, you talked about GPU serving, I think. Uh, Jay, you want to start first? <laughs> oh, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah I think uh, if you if you heard uh, uh, Pong's talk from earlier in the in the ML day. Pong, Pong talked about this uh, machine learning development environment we have, which is really very nice. You know, I've I've worked at more than one company doing machine learning, and this is easily the nicest machine learning infrastructure I've ever gotten to use. So uh, I think that's really powered a lot of the things that you've heard about today. If you've gone to some of the other lightning talks, um, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, please. I, I can interject. Uh, ML like MLM, I think, is like really really nice, and like having worked like here. Before we had it, um, you know, we had our like the computer vision team like needed GPUs like as much as possible, and so we were actually like hosting our own like bare metal servers uh, in some data center, and like things would go down, and then someone would have to go over there and like hit the button to reset it. Um, and like that was like that worked at the time when we were training like relatively small scale models. Um, we're pushing the limits of sort of what is like even trainable at this point. So we're trying to push to a billion params just to see how large can we get these models to really, you know, ingest like the billions and billions of images we have on the site. And there's no way that approach would have scaled with like bare metal servers in some data center. So like the fact that we have this like ML infrastructure, um, like without it, I don't think it would be possible to train the scale of models that we're like aiming for. Um, this includes the generative models, but it also just includes some of our sort of core visual models too, like the visual search model at this point, we're trying to push that as large as we could be. So without uh, the sort of infrastructure that exists, I think a lot of our models just wouldn't exist either. Yeah, I, can, yeah, I can also add a few more, or oh, are we done? Um, we don't have much time left. Maybe one more question actually. Oh, okay, cool. We want to cover it. And also, Eric, I was the one that pushed that button, so I know. <laughs> Uh, cool. So this question, uh, could RL be used for creative exploration uh, aspect, like choosing an image to show uh, for an ad? Stephanie, this hmm. is definitely you. This is a question for me, and I have no idea what the answer is. Um, hmm. We've primarily thought of this as more of a um, a generative model problem, because I don't think we're expecting to have like a continued sequence of um, of interactions with the advertiser. We're sort of thinking this is more uh, the advertiser. We, we generate one set of images for the advertiser. Um, they choose from, say, five or 10 like pre-generated like possibilities. And then uh, we show that ad and that there's not really another action um, or interaction after that. Hmm. I don't have any ideas at this time, but it's an interesting thought. I was I was going to say too that like now that we have this like really 
a cool image generation technology, it's not hard to imagine that like, you know, you could train a model to like generate an image and see how well it does. And so, you know, we don't need like, you know, Madison Avenue people anymore. We can have machine learning models generate their own ads and uh, test them out. Well, this is probably the last question given the time, I think. Uh, in Pinterest for multitask learning, how do we decide the weights between labels uh, from these different tasks? Um, at least for me, I think that's a pretty open-ended question. Like, I don't think there's a clear answer of like exactly what the right way to do this is, right? I think, you know, you could start off by just saying like, I want roughly the scales of each of them to be the same, right? That's implicitly implying some sort of equal importance between your tasks, which sometimes is the right thing you want to do. Um, sometimes you know exactly what metric you want to optimize for, right? And like the extra tasks can then help you sort of support um, like learn additional ancillary information that ends up being useful for the main task. Um, but if you know going into it that like what you're optimizing for is like user engagement, then you, you know, we emphasize that one in the training loss and that tends to work out well in practice. So I think it's an open question. Uh, really the answer is like careful, like having good validation data and then being able to run the evals so you know how these decisions that you're making in your model design. This is true of things beyond just the weight between the sort of various tasks, right? Um, in general, it's just like when you're making these sorts of like hard to decide things, the best way is to sort of have good validation data there and then be able to sort of run the different parameters, assuming you have the ML infrastructure to support it, as we previously alluded to. Um, and then you can go from there and sort of use that to start from a good baseline based on intuition, then refine it based on this sort of hyperparameter validation. You know, the other thing you can do to get, get out of this hyperparameter tweaking business is to say like, well, what do I really care about? I, what I really care about is for users to come back tomorrow or come back next week. And if we say, maybe we can just learn what hyperparameters get them to come back tomorrow and next week. And that's something that we've had some success with uh, here at Pinterest too. I think Jay has a better answer than me, but I was gonna say that in practice, what I've, I've seen is that sometimes you find that the tasks, you have different amounts of data for each of them. Maybe the label is missing sometimes, uh, or there is some imbalance between, say, the frequency of a save action versus the frequency of a save of a hide action. Hopefully the hides are much rarer. And so we might use waiting for the labels simply to, as a way to help balance that data set out a little bit. Makes sense. Okay. I think we're completely out of time. I think we actually went over. Sorry for having you all here longer. Uh, but that concludes the technical uh, panelist discussion. And I think next is probably each other that's listening as well. Yes. Hello, Sonder Twin. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew and the panelists for the great discussion and the many insight for sharing of your past experiences. Um, my name is Bi Chong Chen. I am a tech lead of machine learning technology for core engineering. Well, we are getting to the end of the program. Um, I would like to thank all of you for joining ML Day. I hope that uh, you enjoyed today's program. Um, if you miss any part of the program, don't worry. Uh, we will send an email to all of you with a link to the recordings and also a survey. So when you receive it, please, please fill out the survey so that we know how to make the program better next time so that the program will be more useful for you. Um, and uh, yeah, as you can see, machine learning is very core to Pinterest business. Right? Today, we only have time to cover a small portion of our ML work at Pinterest. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, you can visit pinterestlabs.com, pinterestlabs.com. Right, where you can find our latest research results, papers, and uh, blog posts. Um, one of the reasons that I work at Pinterest is that uh, Pinterest is very different from other online media companies. Right, people associate Pinterest with safe, positive, and inspirational experiences. Um, as a parent, um, I am very comfortable suggesting my kids to use Pinterest, which I cannot say for many other online media apps. Um, 
And our machine learning technology is really the key to providing these safe, positive, and inspirational experiences. Um, and we need talented ML engineers to build such experiences. Right? So if uh, you are interested in working with us, please reach out at uh, keep in touch at pinterest.com. Keep in touch at uh, pinterest.com. Um, we have many interesting ML problems that if solved can make a big positive impact on hundreds of millions of people. Just to give a few examples, um, how can we use machine learning to help users to go from being inspired to really realizing a life they love, right? We talk about many supervised learning methods uh, that those are actually quite mature for predicting users' uh, immediate responses, right? That to some extent indicate whether they find inspirational content or not. However, realizing a life you love is really a long process, right? And uh, as we increase the time horizon, uh, the problem becomes harder and harder. Right? We need to deeply understand a user's journey from inspiration to realization, uh, identify what stage of the journey that uh, the user is currently in, and uh, identify the user's intent at any given point in time. In addition to that, we also need to optimize for the user's long-term objective, uh, maybe using reinforcement learning that we just talked about, right, or iterative, like, refinement methods. Uh, to give another example, right, how can we scale machine learning in a sustainable manner? Uh, in general, we, along with many other people in the ML community, uh, observed that the larger the model, the higher the accuracy, right, also um, the more frequently we train a model, the more effective the model is. However, all these require a large amount of computational resources. Um, how can we continuously scale ML without adding a lot of complexity and without consuming this huge amount of energy? All these are challenging problems. Um, and uh, yeah, if you are interested in solving them, please join us and reach out at uh, keep in touch at uh, pinterest.com. Um, let me thank you again for attending today's ML Day, and uh, I hope we can see you next time.